So hi, everyone. Uh, I also got some rejections this year. <laughs> I think they're, re they're rejecting my best paper, but that's, you know, that's normal. So you should like be zen about it. And even after years of practice, it's not easy. Um, we're not seeing my slides. So today, and, and this presentation, I'll have another one um, uh, Saturday, I think. Uh, I'll be focusing on recurrent nets and attention because the two things are related um, and have been used mostly to deal with sequential data and sequential processing more generally, where uh, you do computation in multiple steps, where you reuse the same parameters over and over through those steps. Okay, well, um, I'm assuming you already know everything uh, that you need to understand the kind of computations happening in neural nets in general and like feedforward nets and uh, computational graphs and backrub. And so um, recurrent nets are a special architecture in which the same parameters are reused at every point in a sequence of computations. Um, so that's particularly convenient if you want to handle variable length sequences where the same computation should be applied independent of exactly where you are in the sequence, but you still want to take into account the dependencies between all of the elements in the sequence. Um, there is also a connection, a way to think about recurrent nets as circuits, right? Your brain is a big circuit and uh, engineers have been designing circuits for chips and so on for many decades. So the, the notation on the left here is a sort of a inspired by the notation used in, in circuits where you're looking at how things are connected, but there are uh, propagation delays for information to go from one place to another place in the circuit. And, and here in the graph, what we're seeing is that the input is connected through a bunch of hidden units, the state variables S, and they send um, their uh, output to some output units, but they also send their output to an instance of themselves in the future, right? We all do that all the time through these recurrent connections, the Ws, and the little square here means a delay of one time step, but you could have other kinds of delays. And now, on the right-hand side, you see how to think about this in terms of the sequence of computations that is being taking place. So we've got a sequence of inputs, the x1, x2, x3, and so on, and at each time step, we're gonna apply the same pattern of computation with the same parameters, the u, the v, and the w, in this very simple example. Um, and so we get this unfolded computational graph, as we say. It's a, it's a very powerful notion that uh, you'll see can be generalized in many ways, as I'll do today in the lecture. Well, and of course, once you've unfolded the computation and you laid it out like this, uh, you can apply the, the same you know, chain rule principle of backprop in order to compute gradients. The only thing that's different from a normal uh, neural net, MLP, like a uh, feedforward net, is that A, we, we use the same parameters multiple times. Uh, two, we can handle variable length sequences. So, so the data we're handling is not a fixed vector. And, um, and three, we'll see that it changes things um, in terms of um, the semantics of the gradients and, and the trouble that, you know, get, that gets us into, as, as we'll discuss. Okay, so to emphasize this notion that by reparameterizing, we can get a much more powerful machine learning approach uh, and sharing parameters across time, consider the alternative where uh, for, every sequence, uh, for every sequence length, we would have a different um, neural net, right? So we can have a function G1 that handles the case where there's one input, a, a function G2 that handles the case where there's two inputs, and we would have separate parameters for each of these cases, and we could have like a neural net for each case, but that would be very, very inefficient. But it's not just inefficient in uh, computations, it's inefficient in a statistical sense because they would not share parameters across the different nets. In addition to sharing uh, across lengths, and so being able to generalize to new lengths you have never seen, um, you're sharing across time steps. So every time step, the, the information you're gathering the computations that is happening at every time step is putting pressure on the same parameters that are used over all the time steps, just like in covnets, right? Um, so that, that sharing is also making it statistically much more efficient. And um, 
And, and, and these two uh, examples, uh, so I mentioned convolutional nets and, and now recurrent nets of sharing parameters is an instance of a more general notion in machine learning and, and um, uh, uh, graphical models of lifting. So in other words, one way to think about this is we, we have really two kinds of objects that we are thinking about. There is the final computation, like the unfolded graph on the right here, um, and there is a more compact way of describing uh, the, the, the type of computation we're doing. So you can think of it, uh, on, on the left we have like the program, and then on the right we have the trace of the program, which goes through all the steps in every loop, right? So these are two different objects, but of course the description, the compact description is the one where um, uh, we, we have the knowledge and the information and, and the trace corresponds to the computation. And we've, by, by separating the two things, we can um, do things like define a few simple rules and then apply those rules in a potentially uh, huge uh, set of ways. And that's, that's what really lifting is about. And so you get generalization. In this case, the most obvious generalization is that you, you can generalize to new time steps and new sequence length. Okay, so that's the general idea of RNNs. But now um, let me connect to graphical models even more by showing how an RNN can be used to represent a joint distribution over a bunch of random variables. Right, so now uh, we have a sequence, x1 to xt, and again, t here, capital T, is going to be something that can vary. So different, um, we're going to be able to assign probability to different sequences of different lengths. Different examples correspond to different sentences, for example, that have different lengths. Uh, and we'd like to represent the joint distribution between those, those variables. And in general, you know, representing joint distributions in high dimension is, is very hard. Um, but we can use the good old, uh, chain rule for conditional probabilities that tells us we can decompose that joint into a bunch of, uh, into a product of conditionals where uh, one variable is going to be predicted, its probability is going to be predicted given all of the others preceding that variable in some order. And of course here, if we're talking about sequential data like text and sounds and so on, there is a natural order. You predict the teeth thing given the previous ones. Okay, so that's like the basics. And of course, if we take the, the log of this or minus the log of this, we can get an objective function. We want to do maximum likelihood. That means we want to maximize the probability of the data. Um, and so we can just plug those probabilities with the observations and uh, we get numbers and we would like to maximize the, um, the, um, the average of those conditional log probabilities. In terms of the neural net architecture, this, the, the, the picture here is, is explaining something that may not be self-obvious, um, that what we're doing here is we're making, say, a prediction about the element t in the sequence given the previous one. So what does it mean we make a prediction? That means we say we compute probability for uh, probabilities for all of the possible values of, of the next symbol or maybe it's a real valued quantity and we predict the mean and the variance of the next element in the sequence given the previous ones. So that's the OT here. So OT is, in, uh, contains the parameters of a distribution over the next element in the sequence. And um, we, can, um, we can then take the actual observed value and measure well, what probability did you did the network give to that observed value? That's going to be the loss. So the, the loss here, I don't know if you see the pointer. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. So the loss uh, depends on the prediction we made of probabilities for all the possible values and the actual value that was present in the data. Okay, so now there's this uh, dotted arrow. What is that dotted arrow? What, what, what it means is that when we are... Um, uh, training, we just take the data as it is and we compute its probability, but we can also use those models to generate new sequences. And this, of course, this is very powerful. This is a special case of a directed graphical model um, where we're going to be able to sample uh, using ancestral sampling. So we just have this order in which we visit all the variables and we're going to sample the teeth variable given the previous one. So it's exactly the same logic, except that instead of 
uh, computing the probability of some real data, we're going to be sampling, uh, say, the teeth element of the sequence, given the ones we have already sampled. So we can generate a completely new sequence ab initio using this. Um, and so that's what the dotted arrow means. It means sample from the distribution that the model has produced for the next symbol, say, and then put that as input for predicting the next one. Okay, so that's what these dotted arrows mean. Um, oh, maybe this is actually a good place to tell you that I'm, I'm quite fine with having questions in the middle of the lecture, um, and we also have time at the end. So is this clear, this, this, these last couple of slides? Are there some questions before I move on? These are very fundamental things, and you know, so don't hesitate to raise your hand. I'm sure many people are potentially um, unclear. Yes. So OT in this uh, example, so O for output, represents a probability distribution over the next object in the sequence. So if, if say, we're talking about symbols like characters or words, OT could be a vector of probabilities for all of the possible values, right? Yes, so you, you have a probability distribution, which is like a vector of numbers, and we're going to be sampling from it by picking one symbol with that probability distribution. Yes? Well, this is not Markovian, right? Because there is no, I mean, the original distribution is not, the, the, the x's are not Markovian, right? So we're not assuming that the, say xt is a summary of the previous ones when you predict the, the next ones. What is uh, really maybe connected to the Markovian ideas here is the state s. So if you, if you carefully look at the architecture, you'll see that all of the information about the pasts, like x1 to xt, uh, I guess, is now somehow summarized into the vector st. So st acts like a Markov state, and, um, but it's a deterministic function of, of the past. So, so we are building a Markov representation out of a non-Markov thing that, that allows to, to process sequences that don't necessarily have a, a Markov structure. Okay, so move, let me move on and show you uh, a bit more about how we can use these things to do all kinds of useful um, applications. But um, let's see first how we can play with the, this idea of unfolding the graph and computing probabilities um, to, to learn all kinds of conditional distributions. So for example, uh, we might want to take a sequence and output a vector or a number, right? So we want to process the whole sequence and then at the end, uh, we're going to take uh, the, the last hidden state and uh, maybe transform it through uh, the V matrix. And then um, in this case, we're not trying to generate an input sequence. We're just trying to m do supervised learning, say, to, uh, to, say, for example, classify a whole sequence. So that's one kind of architecture. Uh, see if the... Yeah, so the, the one on the top right is doing exactly that kind of thing. It's mapping the sequence of x's to an output, which will produce a probability distribution over y's, which is a different thing, like the output uh, variable we're trying to predict. Um, we can do sequence to sequence in, in various ways. So we can do uh, sequence to sequence in, 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 in this, uh, actually these two things here. So we are mapping a, an input sequence to an output sequence. Uh, here, um, yes, the x's are mapped to probability distribution over y's, uh, but in this architecture, for each element in the uh, input x, there is a corresponding prediction or uh, random variable on the output side, and we're also assuming that the thing we care about is predicting the ith output given all the uh, inputs up to i as well, right? Because if you see the, the, the way the computation is organized, the, uh, for example, we can't use the future x's to predict uh, the current y. Uh, 
So that's, that's a particular architecture that may be sensible in some applications. And in the more general setting where I want to map a sequence to a sequence, um, I could do this. Uh, uh, I could use, one way to think about it is two recurrent nets. One which reads the input sequence. In other words, it, it just uh, computes the state that depends recursively on all of the elements in the input sequence. And then that becomes the initial state or extra input for another recurrent net, which is a generative recurrent net, which can produce, can generate, or model the distribution over sequences on the output side. So this is how we do machine translation, at least the you know, simple version of it. We, we have a recurrent net that can read a sequence, produces a vector that's like a representation of the whole input sentence, and then that vector becomes the initial state or some extra input for another recurrent net, which generates a sequence of words in the target language. And so when you generate, you, you see these arrows going back into the input because we are producing an output which then feeds the next input. Uh, you can of course do vector to sequence. So you can take a regular recurrent net that can produce a sequence and you can add an extra input at each time step um, that uh, represents the conditioning information. You can do that with any neural net, right? So any neural net which computes uh, a function or a conditional probability, we can condition its computation by just sticking extra inputs and that's it. That's how we do conditioning. It's very, very simple. All right, so, so now there's something really interesting and kind of troubling uh, about this way that I've been talking about to train recurrent nets. Um, and that's an issue that comes up in other areas in machine learning, but it's really um, the issue, how it, you know, it came up in the problem of training recurrent nets very early on in the 90s, people realized that there's this mismatch between how we train a recurrent net uh, with maximum likelihood, which is called teacher forcing, and how it's eventually going to be used when we generate from it. Okay, so uh, in general in machine learning, you'd like the, the, the kind of computation that you do during training to be of the same form as the kind of computation you do at test time. Otherwise, it might not do what you expect. So, so why is it not matched here? So again, look at the f this sort of circuit and, and, and the computations that can happen, and there are two circuits that I've put on, on top of each other here uh, with the, the training time path and the test time path. So the, the bold uh, arrows are there all the time, but the, the, the dotted ones are different at training and at test time. So when, when we call it teacher forcing because what we do uh, at training time is that we force the inputs to be the ones that were produced by the network itself, right? So we feed the outputs back as inputs. And uh, sorry, 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 but we don't do that. We, we, we take the data um, as, as, as the inputs and the targets, right? Whereas when we use the system at test time, um, we're gonna use the, the, the generated outputs at the output as inputs, right? So, so there, these two paths into the input uh, the, the could be coming either from the, the data, that's the Y here, just feeding the, the data, or it could be coming from the model samples, right? Okay, so why do we care about this? Um, there's an issue of compounding errors. So, so uh, there's a, I remember seeing a talk um, a long time ago that really inspired me to a, a, as a good analogy to see what goes wrong. Let's say you're driving a car, okay? And um, you wanna train a machine to do that. This is a very, uh, uh, rec I mean, a, 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 a very current problem. And so if, if we look at how humans drive the car, they would tend to stay in, in, you know, on the road. And so you have very little training data where a human is about to uh, you know, uh, move out of the road. Um, but when we, and so if we train the recurrent net to behave like a human, it will have lots of data when the, the car is you know, in the right place already, or maybe it's just slightly off, but not too much. But when the network start driving, because it's initially imperfect, especially at the beginning of training, uh, it might veer off the, the road, and then there is no training data there. So, so the kind of situation that it sees at test time could be very different from the kind of situation it sees at training time. But furthermore, there's, uh, it gets worse as the length of the sequence increases, because maybe initially 
the, the, the neural net driving is only veering off a little bit, but then it gets into a place that's sort of slightly unusual, so it has more chances of making even more mistakes, and then it gets even more off of the road, and then it's even more lost because it doesn't look like it's training data, and then it goes even more off, right? So you can see how uh, you can have this compounding error effect, which is uh, not easy to fix. And so there's been a number of proposals to, to deal with that. Um, and uh, the general idea of these proposals is sort of mix the, the samples that were generated by the model and the data as inputs. And sometimes you use one, sometimes you use the other so as to make the system more robust to, these, uh, to this mismatch. Um, okay, and then in terms of the architectures, the architecture I showed you initially is very, very simple and you can, you can expand it and, uh, and, and uh, improve it in many ways. Um, you can make it deeper, for example, in, in many ways. So the notion of depth here becomes confusing because uh, what is depth for a recurrent net? Um, so um, on the left, you have sort of a, a, a very uh, vanilla architecture. Um, in the bottom here, you have a variation where we're gonna think of it like we're gonna stack multiple RNNs on top of each other. So the, the hidden units of the lower RNN becomes an extra input or the input for the uh, next RNN, and you can have many of these. You can also increase depth by um, uh, considering the transition from T minus one to T, um, and instead of having a direct connection where there's no hidden unit in between, you can, you can stick extra steps of computation, so extra depth, in between the transformation from T minus one to T. So the only problem with this is it makes the length of the paths from the beginning of the sequence to the end of the sequence longer, which could help the expressive power, but can also hurt with uh, the long-term dependencies issue I'll tell you about later. And so what was proposed in this uh, 2014 paper is to introduce skip connections. You'll see we come back to skip connections that, that allow shortcuts in the uh, unfolded graph. Um, so this idea of sharing parameters in to create unfolded architectures that uh, may have, in the end, very few degrees of freedom but can do very complex computation uh, has been generalized not just to chains like in RNNs but also to trees and, in fact, to any kind of graph. Um, and so a few of the architectures from the early days of deep learning are there. So the, the tree structure is very natural. Um, uh, what's not so uh, easy in the case of trees is some, some, somebody has to tell us the structure of the tree. Uh, but then once you have the structure, each node is gonna apply the same parameters. Uh, instead of each node taking input from say the previous one in a chain, it might take input from two nodes, like the two children, right? And so that's how you get a tree structure. Uh, you can also have trees that have any kind of arity, but maybe you have nodes that have two inputs, others that have three inputs, that's easy to handle. Um, you can also do even more crazy things like the bi-directional RNN uh, from the late 90s where now the notion of time is kind of lost a little bit and instead you, you have to think of, um, it's not a, it's not a <laughs> unfolded circuit anymore. It's, it's something uh, that's kind of uh, really cool where you, you have an RNN running forward in time so you have still, like data is still coming as a sequence. You have an RNN that's like normally going forward in time, but you have another one that's going backward in time. And, and you can make these two guys somehow share information or at least have their state being the input for further processing. That was the original proposal. And that actually is very powerful. So if you're thinking about processing a sequence, like a sentence, uh, the traditional RNN, uh, when it processes the teeth word would only be able to use the left context. But really to interpret a word at position T, often we need to look at you know, what's coming after. And so by using an RNN that comes from the future back to now, you can do that. Of course, that only makes sense if we're looking at bounded sequences and we process the whole sequence at the same time. But in many cases, you can do that, like in machine translation, and we use this in our 2014 paper that was so successful as a pre-processing stage in, in the architecture. Um, and um, you can create all kinds of graphs. For example, Alex, Alex Graves showed how you can use um, a, a 2D structure to create an unfolded graph, which is not a chain, but, but a sort of grid where at position, say, ij, 
um, the node uh, takes input from the uh, node i minus 1j and the node ij minus 1. And then so you build a sort of grid that, that is going to go through the image. So if you're looking at image data, you can do it in higher dimensions as well. Um, you can also change the way that uh, the uh, input and the previous state are, com are combined. So in, in this, the x here represents the, the input, the time t for the RNN, and z represents the, the previous state. And we typically would do some you know, weighted sum and then just add up the result. But you can also multiply them, and, and some more generally like combine multiplications and additions. And in fact, you can do that with about the same number of computations and get something that's more, ex more, um, more expressive than, than the simple sum. So this is called multiplicative interactions, the current net. Um, one of the, maybe one of the most uh, uh, important ideas that remains present in a lot of current architecture is the idea of having multiple timescales and the hierarchy in the structure of the recurrent net. And we'll see in the next part of my presentation about uh, long-term independencies why this is such a useful idea. So, so as we'll see, when we try to train recurrent nets over very long sequences, um, the, 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 tr the gradient uh, uh, has the uh, short-term effects hide the long-term effects, which have a much smaller magnitude. And so one way around that is to create short shortcuts, to create paths in the unfolded graph, which allow to go from something far in the past to something far in the future in just a few hops. And the natural way to do that is to think about um, underlying variables going um, through the sequence at different scales. You have like fast time scales where you have little details being taken care of and you have slow time scales where you have more abstract stuff happening. And so many approaches have been proposed to do that and, um, and we'll see a few more later. So, so you can see the general theme here uh, with the different time scales, and it doesn't have to be discrete scales, it could be continuous. I mean, like, uh, they can all be updated at the, at the same rate, but, but the changes could be larger for some than for others. Okay, so the long-term dependencies problem and so-called gradient vanishing and gradient explosion problem is something that, that I studied in the early 90s and got published in 93 and 94. And that remains, I think, one of the important research challenges for recurrent nets. So what did we do in this paper? Um, we considered a very simple architecture. The simplest possible recurrent net has a single input, a single hidden unit, and a single output, okay? And it has a single recurrent weight, that's a scalar, W. And so you can ask, what can you do with this? Well. Turns out with a single unit and, and a feedback loop, you can store one bit of information. So for people who uh, have uh, training in electrical engineering and, and, and so on, uh, you can store one bit uh, like a memory uh, with a, a flip-flop design architecture, which is very similar to this. So you have this nonlinearity, which means that if, um, uh, so if the, um, if the state is positive, is large and positive, like close to one, um, and, and the weight is greater than one, then that sort of gets reinforced and we again have something large and positive that's gonna feed the, the, uh, the activity of the neuron. And so you're gonna stay at a large positive value. And it's not gonna go you know, crazy because the neuron has a, a saturating nonlinearity like hyperbolic tangent. If the activity is large negative, like minus one, then uh, we multiply by a number that's greater than one, we get again uh, something large, but now negative as input, and so that will produce a large negative output, but, but bounded by minus one. And so we're gonna stay close to minus one again for a long time. So, so, I so there's this notion here of dynamics now that we have to think about. And, and we have to think about um, how the state evolves through some trajectories and we have to think of the notion of attractors. So a very important basic notion in, in, in dynamical systems theory. So the, the, the trajectories could uh, tend to converge to some sets of points. That's what attractors are. And um, in our case, if we want to store one bit of information, we need two places 
where the state could converge, where you know, one would represent when you want to store the bit zero and one would represent when you want to store the bit one. So depending on where you start, this is the, the state space here if it was 2D, even though here it's 1D. Um, depending on where you start, uh, you know, if you're on one side of this boundary, uh, you might go to this attractor. If you're on the other side, you might go to the other attractor. And if I, um, if I put some input here that's large and positive, I'm going to kick out the, the, the content of the memory and, 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 and you know, bring it to the, 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 the plus one state. Whereas if I put something large and negative as input, I'm going to kick out wherever it was and put it around this space, and then it's, then it's going to stay there. Okay. So what's, what makes those attractors attractors is that the different trajectories um, in, in the basin of attraction all converge there. And the con converging means that if you apply the transformation from T to T plus 1 and you start from two nearby points, those two nearby points get closer to each other. And if you do it over and over again, eventually they converge to the same place, or at least to the same set of points. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, why, why is that a problem? Well, um, basically, um, you can already see that there, if you think a little bit about derivatives now, so consider, think about how, so derivatives are how things change when other things change in, in an in infinitesimal way, right? So, so if two nearby trajectories that start, say, one here and the other here, all converge to the same place, it means that the derivatives some derivatives are zero, right? It means that if I make a small change from my initial state, um, I get to the same place. So the derivative of the final state with respect to the initial state is zero, right? The, the final state didn't change, but the initial state changed, so the ratio is zero. On the other hand, if I start on the boundary and I make a small change that brings me on one side versus a change that makes me on the other side. Now I see a small change being amplified into a huge change, right? Depending on which side, I can do an epsilon small thing around the boundary, and I, one case I land here, and the other case I land here. So now the gradient is infinite or really large. So this is, this is really the source of the uh, vanishing gradient and um, uh, exploding gradient problem seen uh, under the light of um, dynamical systems. Um, now, what we showed in the paper, in addition to understanding, you know, putting this in the light of dynamical systems, is if we want to store bits of information in a stable, reliable way, we need that sort of convergent transformations. We need the, the Jacobian matrix, that's the derivative of the next state given the current state, to have eigenvalues that are all less than one. So less than one means that two things that are close to each other get mapped to something closer. Greater than one means they can get away from each other. So, uh, so, so, the, so what we show is that um, if we want this contractive property which gives us stability, uh, we can store bits of information, but then we're going to be suffering from vanishing gradients. So why do we get vanishing gradients? So I told you that um, we, to get stability, we want these Jacobian matrices to have eigenvalues less than one, but we're going to consider through the chain rule the multiplication of all of these Jacobian matrices uh, that relate, uh, say, some initial state to some final state and eventually to some loss. Okay, so when we multiply a bunch of matrices, all of uh, which have small values, less than one, eigenvalues less than one, we get something whose uh, eigenvalues are exponentially smaller. Okay, so that means close to zero. And that's a, a sort of an algebraic way of seeing what I tried to show you visually by saying, okay, a small change here becomes uh, no change or a small change becomes a large change, right? So that's what derivatives are about. Um, so actually, before I, I, I published that paper, um, Seth Hushrider uh, had similar ideas, at least uh, he, he figured out the problem of vanishing gradients um, and this, this problem with multiplying all of these matrices in his uh, thesis in 1991. Um, and he's been very active. Uh, he's also the person who uh, essentially invented LSDMs that I'm going to tell you about next. 
Okay, now uh, let me try to explain uh, slightly uh, more carefully why this vanishing gradient is going to hurt learning long-term dependencies, right? You could say, well, the gradient gets small, but I could just scale up the learning rate and then I don't care, right? It's never zero exactly, numerically. The problem is we have weight sharing uh, across time. And so the total gradient, one way to write it, it doesn't matter how you compute it, but mathematically it's always the sum over all of the um, ways that um, a particular um, um, a particular uh, weight vector gets used at all the time steps uh, to produce some effect later in the future. And that's what this, that's what this sum is saying, right? So, so the parameters could influence the state at time tau, and then that could influence the final cost later. And we're gonna sum all of those influences. So when tau is close to t, then it's a short-term influence. When tau is much um, smaller than t, then it's a long-term influence. The problem is if we develop this, um, this uh, derivative, uh, actu actually this derivative, uh, we see this uh, Jacobian matrix that says how does a change of the state in the past influence the state in the future. And remember, that was the thing I told you that would vanish to zero if, uh, if the eigenvalues are less than one, which is what we need to store information reliably. And so, so now what's gonna happen is we have, we have a, a sum and it's weighted by these uh, products of matrices and for the long-term cases where tau is much less than t, um, the, those weights are gonna be, those matrices are gonna be very small, right? And so we, what happens when you add a large number and a small number? Well, the small number kind of disappears, right? You, you lose it. I mean, it's kind of lost in the noise. And so that's what happens uh, when you compute gradients in whatever way that's exact in uh, RNNs, what, what happens is that the norm of the gradient is dominated by the short-term effects. How, it, so it, it's gonna learn how to produce the right answers based on the information that's close by in the sequence. And it could, in theory, also use the information that's far away, but that's kind of hidden in the gradient. And it's hard for it to figure it out. It's gonna have to first get the terms due to the short term close to zero because it, it, it nails how to use that information before it can use the long term information. And then because of you know, all the small numerical variations, it's still gonna be hard to do that. It's gonna take a lot of time. Okay. Um, and by the way, this is very different from the situation that you have in deep nets. Even very deep nets have potentially a vanishing problem, but because they don't share weights, um, so you, you can make a parallel here, like this is an RNN unfolded, then this is a deep net unfolded. But you see, besides the fact that you have different inputs at each time step, the more important thing here is that the weights are not shared across different layers in a normal deep net. And so you don't have this problem of short and long paths being added together in the gradient. And so it's easier to deal with the problem in, in, in deep nets than in RNNs. Okay, so, so I've been focusing mostly on what happens when the gradients shrink and vanish because this is the situation we care most about. But sometimes, again, come back to this picture, um, we get gradients, so if you are near the, the basin's boundary, you get gradients that are very large. And gradients that are very large are also bad because gradient descent doesn't like large gradients. Uh, gradient descent uh, works if you make very small steps. If you start making big steps, then the basically those steps are meaningless and you're not guaranteed to go down anymore. Gradient descent works when you make small steps because you're saying, you're thinking that this, the function is smooth and so, you know, if, if, if I'm making these almost infinitesimal steps, but if I make large steps, it's not true. So, so we also need to take care of the gradient explosion, which tends to throw off optimization. So you're training and suddenly the error goes up. This is something that happens with recurrent nets. Okay. Um, so it turns out that for the gradient explosion, there is a trick which works reasonably well and handles most of the cases. Um, essentially what you're saying is when the gradient is large, don't trust it. At least don't trust its norm. Uh, so you can just renormalize the, 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 the gradient norm when it's above a threshold. And because these are fairly rare events, 
uh, it doesn't matter too much how you handle this, so long as you move, uh, you don't make these crazy, uh, crazy steps. All right, so this, this paper, I'm not gonna go through the list here that uh, in 2013 lists uh, all of the tricks that people have come up with to try to deal with training RNNs, but uh, I'll, I'll go through some of them. I've already talk, talked about a few. Um, so I mentioned the skip connection. This is a very old idea. So right after I wrote my paper in 94, in 95, there was a NIPS paper, actually two NIPS papers, one, um, uh, no, I guess it's uh, it's uh, not a NIPS paper. The other one is an ICML paper um, that um, that really helped us deal with the problem of long-term dependencies uh, in in two different ways that introduce shortcuts in the unfolded graph. Right? That I already mentioned that idea. So uh, you can have what's called delays or skip connections. This is like in the graph here. So you say, oh. Um, you allowed at time uh, t to look at what was going on at t minus three, for example. And so that will create, if you, if you consider the sequence of all these longer jumps, that will create a path from the, the past to the future that has less of these nonlinear steps that, or, or the, 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 the Jacobians that kill you. Um, so that's one thing. It's not clear how to use that idea. And the other is the, the idea of hierarchy that I mentioned. Um, for example, recent papers um, on modeling uh, texts often use this structure where we have one level that looks at words and say one level that looks at sentences. So there's a, a part of the RNN state which gets updated after each sentence and uh, one that gets updated after each word. And, and if you were treating characters, you could do three levels, right? Characters, words, and sentences. Of course, the problem with that is it assumes that you know uh, where, you know, when the updates, when, when those changes happen. Like in English, it's easy to know where the separation is, but in general, if, say, it's uh, acoustic speech, it's, it's, it's harder to know wh where you should do these, um, uh, you should move one level up. And, um, and so there's also been work in trying to learn automatically when to move up to the next level and how to segment uh, hierarchically uh, a sequence. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just want you to know that uh, that has been done. Um, and, and this one I already mentioned uh, uses um, the word level and the sentence level. And so in a dialogue, actually, something really important because um, what happens otherwise is your dialogue system uh, kind of forgets, doesn't take into account the things that have happened maybe a few sentences back because there's so many words in the past that the normal RNN just fails to capture that. Okay, um, and then um, another idea which is extremely popular, probably the most uh, popular idea to deal with uh, long-term dependencies, or at least to mitigate it, uh, and as I said, that was really introduced by Seb Hoshreiter, is the uh, idea of using gates. So idea of using units that control a weight or control the activity of another unit and using those gates in order to create loops in the unfolded path um, that have a uh, derivative close to one. Right? So remember, in order to avoid uh, the vanishing problem, we need to have some eigenvalues that are not too s much smaller than one. Um, and uh, if we create a path where the, the derivatives along the path are close to one, like if you say that the new state is equal to the old state plus some update, same thing you find in ResNet, for example, uh, then the Jacobian matrix here is, is close to the identity. Now you don't need to have this for all of the dimensions, but it's enough to have it on a few dimensions. And so along those paths, you will have information that can, that can be propagated over a very long duration. So that's the idea of LSTMs. And there's a, um, a uh, version of it uh, that's kind of simpler, that's called the GRU, Gated Recurrent Unit, uh, which we proposed uh, a few years ago, that also works quite well. So the general idea is that we, we don't want eigenvalues of this Jacobian to be too large because we get exploding gradient. We don't want these eigenvalues to be too small 
compared to one because we get vanishing gradients. So we'd like them to be near one. And so as you know, thinking about this, a few researchers have thought, well, why don't we uh, constrain the architecture? So in the LSTM, it's not a hard constraint, actually. It, it sort of encourages the, the some paths have eigenvalues near one, but, but um, could we do something stronger? So, so in uh, 2016, we proposed something called unitary RNNs, where uh, we consider complex valued RNNs, which is not the main idea, but you can think of uh, orthogonal matrices are the equivalent for complex matrices of um, uh, unitary matrices. So unitary is sort of a, uh, more general than orthogonal, and orthogonal matrices and unitary matrices all have eigenvalues that are exactly one. Uh, they also have eigenvectors that are, um, uh, that are orthogonal and of norm one. Um, the problem, so, so that actually worked quite well for some very simple tasks like the copying information from the past to the future, but, but it doesn't work that well in uh, ordinary applications like modeling language. Uh, where the long-term dependencies are not really the most important ones, but the short-term ones are very important. Uh, there was also problems in the initial uh, parameterization that didn't have enough degrees of freedom in, in, in the way it, it was done. So the way it was done is to uh, guarantee we get a unitary matrix for the weights. We uh, obtain it as a product of simpler unitary matrices, each of which can be parameterized in a way that I won't go into details. But it wasn't a rich enough parameterization. And more recently, other papers have proposed richer parameterization. And, more in, and uh, maybe one of the last in the series actually uh, goes beyond the set of, uh, of these normal matrices that have orthogonal uh, bases and uh, allows what's called non-normal matrices, which still have eigenvalues that are one, but, but have uh, a decomposition using the Schur decomposition that, that allows a, a richer uh, a larger set of matrices to be, uh, to be uh, uh, allowed by, by the learning. Okay, um, I'm gonna make a short pause here if there are questions. I went through a lot of material, yeah. Yes. So the information does get carried forward. The problem is that uh, when you uh, look at the gradient, whichever way you compute it, the true gradient um, contains short-term effects and long-term effects, and, and, and the short-term effects dominate. Now, if you do backpropagation over blocks, this is actually you know, commonly used for uh, reasons that uh, more have to do with uh, memory consumption. Um, then you basically forget the long-term things in the gradient, not in the computation. The computation takes into account the past, but the, the learning and the gradient basically look at short-term effects only. So, so these uh, truncated gradient, as it's called, is, is very commonly used. And the reason it's used, um, as I said, is because if you, if you try to do recurrent net over a very long sequence, that means like you have the same template of uh, parameters that is gonna be copied over many times, right? And, uh, and you have to store in memory all of the activities in between. And if you, if you have a like, sequence of words, it doesn't matter. But if, if you have like a video and you have like a lot of computations going on for each time step, now if you do 10,000 of these, uh, it's just gonna blow up your memory. We don't have enough memory in current architectures to do that. And, um, and so people use truncated gradient where we, we do the forward pass as normal but we do the backprop pass by little blocks where we only backprop a little bit and, and that means we only need to store um, a, a little bit of the sequence at a time. Another question? Yeah. Can you think of hierarchical arrays as kind of memory space or memory identity arrays? Uh, there are connections to memory, so I'm gonna come back to memory in, in the next few slides. I don't see the connection, but maybe there is one. Yes? Uh, 
Well, that's actually what unitary means, right? So, but you don't want just imaginary. You want um, you want the, the the radius part to be one, and you want the the exponent to be doing uh, the work. But that's in the scalar case. In, in the in the vector case, you the generalization is is really uh, unitary matrices. Uh, and, and, and uh, well, I guess the, the more general situation, in fact, is the non-normal matrices, which include um, uh, potential interactions between the different dimensions. But, but yeah, you, you have the, the right idea that we are really doing rotations uh, if we do pure unitary transformations or orthogonal transformations. Yes, in the back. The stability, yes. Okay, so first of all, unlike in the traditional um, linear systems, uh, dynamical systems, you don't care about the, the activity exploding because everything is bounded if you use things like hyperbolic tangent. So the problem isn't that the computation explodes with the, 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 the normal application of the RNN. The problem is the gradients can explode or the gradients can become too small. Right, so it's a very different concern. The stability that I was talking about is regards the ability to store information in a stable way so that like a little bit of noise will not make you forget that bit of information. So if I if I want to remember bits of information for a long time, I want to have a stable process that uh, doesn't get kicked out of its sort of stable attractors um, to, to keep the information. Is, is that clear? Well, you can look at the error epoch after epoch. <laughs> So I didn't hear. Uh, yeah, I didn't hear you what you said about Jacobian. So no, it, it's not enough to know the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues tell you something really important, but there's a lot more going on. Um, so you might have the eigenvalues operating in a good regime, but it doesn't mean that learning is going to be good. However, what we know is that if the eigenvalues are too large or too small, then you're in trouble. Yeah. Okay, um, so now um, I'm, I'm gonna start now kind of a second part, it's gonna be short, um, that connects what I've been telling, uh, the story that I've been telling you with both memory and attention which are actually very closely related. And I think that basically they solve the problem of long-term dependency. So let me, let me try to um, uh, give you a gist of that. So uh, in my 94 paper, the theorem that we had really assumes that we have a fixed dimension state, which is, you know, in, in the 90s, nobody would have thought you would like store things that take a huge amount of memory, you typically think of a small system that has a fixed state that's small compared to the length of the sequences and the amount of data that's coming. And so what it means is that the, the, the RNN or whatever dynamical system has to compress information. It's reading that sequence, which has you know, a huge number of bits and, and then representing that in a fixed number of bits or a fixed number of real numbers with fixed precision. Um, and so, so why is that a problem and how is that connected to the vanishing gradient? Well, if you're compressing information, that means you're losing information. That means two potential values like of the sequences in the past that were close to each other get mapped to the same thing. That's what losing information means, right? And that means um, in that, that there are derivatives that are zero, right? If if two points, if you have a many to one mapping, that means the derivative of that transformation is zero in some direction. Or maybe they get close to each other and so the derivative is small but not necessarily zero, 
But in both cases, you're going to get vanishing gradients potentially. So, so the, the, the fundamental source of the vanishing gradient problem is that we want to compress information. And when you lose information, well, the gradients will be small. Um, so, so maybe a solution to the problem fundamentally is to say, let's go non-parametric. Let's assume we have tons of memory. And if you look at humans, well, you know that your human brain has enough capacity in terms of number of synapses to store your whole lifetime in video. So, well, we don't, I, I mean, most people don't remember their whole lifetime, but some actually, we don't understand why, do remember a lot of the details that we throw away. But, it, but in any case, everybody has memory from a long time ago, and we're able to retrieve those memories at any time when they're relevant, sometimes not perfectly, of course, and it gets worse as you get older, I can tell you. Um, but we have that. So, um, so the idea of extending neural nets with memory is something very powerful that has been around in the deep learning community now for a few years. The first papers came in 2014 and uh, 15 and 16. Um, and the way I think about it from the point of view of uh, recurrent nets is, so now we have, we have to think in dynamical systems terms of two kinds of state variables. We have what I call the micro state, which is like the RNN state. But we also have a macro state, which contains the, the memory that somehow you're deciding to keep. So like in your brain, the activity of your neurons is the micro state. And then there is the content of all the synapses, at least those in your memory, that uh, is much larger and is able to store like your whole lifetime. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so then the idea with memory is you can, you can retrieve something from anywhere in the past stored uh, event, stored um, uh, activity, and so create a sort of skip connection that spans a very long uh, uh, part of the sequence. Uh, and that basically breaks the problem of long-term dependencies. Okay. Um, so, the, so that's the gist. Now let me go in a little bit more detail. Uh, so one of the key ingredients in this, uh, because we want to be able to train, now we consider memory as part of the state, we have to be able to backprop through the activity of reading from memory and writing into memory. And uh, one of the key ingredients in for doing this is attention mechanisms, actually. So that's, that's the connection between memory and attention. Um, so the, these attention mechanisms really became um, front and center in, in deep learning with uh, work on machine translation, where we wanted to do sequence to sequence, but, but the architecture that I mentioned earlier, where we transform the input sentence into a vector, and then we, we, we generate the output sentence, um, it just loses too much information precisely because it, you know, it has a finite dimensional state. And so um, the solution that really worked well is to use an attention mechanism that allows the generator, the, 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 the decoder, the, the thing that generates the output sentence, at any point to look back in the input sequence and look back in the, the state of the, the, the reading network and, um, and pick information from there. And so in order to do that, um, well, you have to bite the bullet that you're gonna be actually looking at all the positions and you're gonna score all of those positions with an attention weight and then say one of the positions is gonna win and have a larger weight and that's basically gonna control what information gets fed for the next computation. That's essentially what we did. So, so, you know, the idea in attention mechanism is we're going to compute these attention scores that will say how much uh, uh, relative weight, so with this, this is softmax, we're going to give to some uh, point in the past here at position J. And then we're going to take the, the, the content, which we call the value now, at position J, and we're going to weigh all of the possible locations, the possible time steps. Um, so H here is a vector, but A is a scalar. So we have a weighted sum of these things. So that's like reading from the past states of the RNN. And we could use the same thing to read from memory. This is what memory extended nets essentially do. 
Uh, and, and for machine translation, this worked incredibly well. Uh, in, in a matter of less than a year, uh, Google implemented these kinds of ideas, and, and, and this led to um, a huge improvement in the quality of translation that I don't need to tell you more about because we've all used this. Um, the same ideas can be used uh, in graph neural nets to, uh, to deal with uh, a variable size uh, neighborhoods, but I'm not going to go into the details of that. Um, the important thing here is you can also think of attention to read from memory rather than to, to read from um, uh, the state of a RNN. Basically, your past activity is your memory. If you put every moment of your past state in memory, then you can then recover it later and uh, use attention to decide where you want to read. You can also use attention to decide where you want to write. This is the innovation of the neural train machine. Um, and, um, and, and this connects to fundamental questions in machine learning and, and AI uh, that have to do with my title. I, in my title, I mentioned system one and system two. So in cognitive science, psychologists have tried to create a distinction between kinds of tasks, which they call system one, and kinds of tasks they call system two. And system one are things that are intuitive, that you can do very quickly, like in half a second. Uh, you can do these things in a completely unconscious way. You don't need to know what you're doing. You know the answer. Like when, when, I, when I use my vision and I recognize an object, like my phone, I, I don't need to think about how I do that. I get the answer right away. And, and these computations can be fairly complex, like your, your visual system. And, and current deep learning is good at that. Right? This is, these are the things that deep learning is good at. On the other hand, system two uh, tasks are things like, oh, I, I ask you to add 31 and 21. I'm, I'm sure you can all do that in your head, right? But the way you do it in your head goes through a sequence of steps. It's fairly slow. You use kind of reasoning and logic. Um, and it's linguistic and conscious, meaning you can actually explain what you did to someone else. And there's a almost one-to-one -one mapping between the operations you're doing in your head uh, that are conscious and uh, how it comes out in natural language. Okay, and, and, and that part we, we don't know uh, so well how to do, but, um, but what I'm claiming is that these attention mechanisms and memory are key ingredients for us to make progress on these things. Um, and in fact, uh, like a lot of the uh, modern uh, natural language processing with deep learning uses uh, attention mechanisms for doing these things, things like answering questions and, 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 and reasoning. Um, so let me go back to this idea that uh, if we store things in memory, they uh, we can uh, bypass the, uh, the problem of long-term dependencies. And, and I, one way to get that is to think of the state of the memory, like in other words, what is stored at every location in the memory um, is the, the macro state I was telling you about. And then how is that changing from t to t plus one, right? So you have to think of it like a copy of the whole state of the memory at each time step. And then what are the operations we do with memory? Well, mostly, most memory cells will not be modified at every time step. And so things are just passively copied which means there's a path that goes straight from when the data was written to when it might be read, like a year later. Um, of course, when you write into the memory, then, then you, you, you lose potentially information. But for the most part, like the Jacobian matrix is full of like, like ones on the identity, uh, on, on the diagonal, right? So it's, it's like really um, avoiding a lot of the potential vanishing that could happen. Um, yeah, the last part is self-attention and uh, transformers, uh, which are the state of the art now for many NLP problems. And it, it started by using attention in creative ways. So the, the idea of self-attention is that, okay, so uh, the traditional thinking of attention is like visual attention where I focus my attention on something external, like, like the, the image, uh, elements of the image. But self-attention means I focus attention on my previous computation, like the stuff that I put in my memory, right? That's, it's just a particular kind of attention um, that has been used initially to do things like um, uh, process all kind of data structures using attention mechanisms. I'm not gonna go into detail of that. Um, also, 
a really nice innovation that, that came a few years ago is that when you do attention, you can use multiple what's called attention heads. What it means is instead of selecting one thing from your memory or from the macro state or whatever, you can select, say, five things. I say five because this is like happens to also be uh, how many things you can manipulate consciously, uh, conveniently. And, um, and so you're going to have, uh, instead of one weight per element, you're going to have, say, five weights. And each of them is going to be computed separately. You can think of it like we're going to be finding five elements in a set. And we have uh, five queries which specify what we're looking for. And we're going to compare these queries with all of the keys that are going to be, uh, say, vectors corresponding to, think of it like the, the, the type or the, the, the nature of each of the elements. And we're going to um, use the match between the query and the keys in order to compute for each of the keys a scalar, which tells us how close they are in a way, and then a softmax to pick um, to and enhance the, the close ones. And we're going to use those weights to weight the different values. But we're going to do it in parallel over, say, uh, five different um, elements that are going to be picked from the set. So, so what attention really does is it moves the style of processing from sequential processing to working on sets. Right? So an attention mechanism works on a set. And uh, it, it, the idea of uh, transformers and self-attention is really that we can take these sets and, and, and uh, create new sets at each level in, in these applications of, um, of uh, attention mechanism. All right, I, um, I just want to mention this little figure here that illustrates how a, a transformer that uh, up is applied on the whole sentence can um, modify the representation, the value associated with a word, like, like it, to take into account the context, which may vary. So for example, here, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. And so it is going to take its meaning by using an attention mechanism that looks at all the other words. But here, whoops, here it's, it's really paying attention to animal to define the meaning of it, whereas in the other sentence where it's the animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide, it refers to the street, and so it's going to take its meaning by looking at the word street. Of course, this is completely dynamic, and it's like with attention mechanism, it's like if we had dynamic connections. Like on the fly, we're deciding how one element in the set gets connected to another element in, in the set at the next level. OK. Um, Last paper I want to mention is the self-attentive attentive backtracking, which really uh, implements some of these ideas in, a, in, a, uh, in the context of an agent that's looking at a sequence and uses self-attention to select a few elements from the past microstate in order to take a decision at the next time step. And, uh, and, and we showed how that can be uh, helping to deal with long-term dependencies um, and vanishing gradients. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop here and talk about uh, more abstract stuff in, in my next lecture and talking about consciousness and all kinds of cool things. All right. Thanks. So we have a few more minutes for questions. Yes, in the back here. Yes, attention is selection. Yes, yes, uh, but that's what you do with things like transformers, right? So exactly um, what, what's happening here is that um, each representation vector corresponding to each position in the sentence is going to capture dependencies between words that were you know, potentially very far away in the sentence. And as you, this is only one layer. You're going to do it oh, maybe like 20 times. And so in this way, you can capture dependencies that uh, involve many words together. <laughs>
Yes. Yes. So there's, okay, so first of all, I want to say that uh, I should have said that uh, the, the, the self-attention and the transformer architectures currently are the state of the art in a large set of NLP tasks. So they've become like ubiquitous. And very recently, there's a paper on, uh, I think, XLNet, it's called Extra Large Net, um, which combines self-attention and recurrence. So, so the thing with the pure self-attention is there's no recurrence anymore, um, but the computation grows as n squared and there are other issues. Um, and so these guys, uh, I think the paper is led by uh, Russell Akutinov, um, combines transformers for like processing one sentence at a time and then recurrence across sentences. And in this way you can you can keep a long-term context and keep the computation reasonably um, bounded. Yes? So a large set magnitude gradient problem, can you have a trace of the gradient? A trace of gradient? Yeah, so we know there's a gradient in the past, and then uh, can, can you make like a trace of any gradient and then add the past, and then maybe add the problem to the gradient? Mm, I don't understand your idea, so I, I'm not sure it works. Um, maybe it does, but you know, people have been thinking about this for a while. And the exact, it, dep it doesn't depend how you compute the gradient. Like, the gradient is wrong, in a sense, right? <laughs> so it's not like a simple, it doesn't matter how you compute it. There's somebody in the back there, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I mean, recurrent nets have been used for time series forecasting for a long time. But I, I don't know. Uh, yes? Um, how do you okay, good question. So in my 94 paper, long term was 20 time steps uh, in the sense that <laughs> 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 these very small nets train on like just remembering a few bits of information, uh, trained by backprop, just start failing miserably after 20, 30, 50 steps. Um, and modern approaches based on gating, like LSTMs, GRUs, and so on, they can do like order of a thousand. Um, maybe some more modern things can do a couple of thousand. Um, yeah, that's kind of the scale where we are. But these are for very simple tasks. For It's harder to measure for very complicated tasks where you have both short-term and long-term dependencies. Uh, you know, how, how much, you, uh, how, what, Lengths make you fail, but but that gives you uh, a sense of yes in the back. Yes, so system two behavior is about um, in good part it's about sequential reasoning. So. The, the, the thing with um, uh, recurrent nets is they can, they can be used to process a sequence of inputs, but they can also be used to do a sequence of steps of computations on the same input. And uh, when you uh, want to do things like reasoning or planning or um, uh, the kinds of operations I ask you to do with uh, adding numbers, uh, that's more or less what you're doing. And when you do that, you, you want both short-term memory and long-term memory. So short-term memory, it's very obvious, like you, you often we want to use a paper because it's more convenient, like we don't use, we don't use our, our brain. And, and long-term memory is also important because uh, a, a lot of the reasoning we're doing is connected to um, uh, using information from events in the past. So, so let me tell you a little, little story that is uh, uh, one I usually tell when I, 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 I talk about the, um, this paper, uh, the self-attentive uh, backtracking. So let's say you're, um, you're driving your car, I like somehow driving your car, but, uh, which is bad for the climate, but anyways. Uh, so you're, you're driving your car and uh, you hear a pop sound and you'd notice it and somehow it goes into your memory because it's sort of salient, but you, you continue driving. And then maybe an hour later, uh, you stop your car, maybe you need to take some gas, and you go out of your car, oops, and you see that one of the tires is becoming flat. And so you think, oh, it must have been the pop sound. 
And you may even think, oh, I should have stopped there and maybe, you know, fixed the problem. Okay, so what happened in this episode is I've, I've used a, a long-term event, I mean, long-term dependency um, that happened far in the past, I mean, at the level of 100 millisecond time steps uh, that was stored in my memory in order to reason about an explanation for what is being observed and also to do what's called credit assignment, which is, you know, I'm going to learn how to not do it again, right? So all of these things, um, in including the causality relationship and uh, the reasoning aspects and so on, that's like system two. Right? This is things humans are very good at and memory is very useful for it. Yes? Are you in places that are it's a memory for where you can store carefully browser memory? Or you actually talk about trying to build a word model browser memory and then you transcend those browser things to model things? It's like the distinction is um, are you trying to say you should more use this memory system as a like as a scaling buffer and then we draw samples from that? Or are you uh, We don't draw samples from the memory, we, we retrieve information from the memory. Right, right. So we also have a system in our brain that chooses what goes in memory. So we don't actually store everything in memory. First of all, we store only high level representations. Like you'll notice that you typically forget the details of what happened in the past. You only remember sort of the high level story. And yeah, I'm not sure I understand the rest of your question. Yeah, yeah, it's connected to model free and model based. That's true because the, the model based include this notion that I can project myself into the future by unfolding a model of the, of the world. So that's one, I, di I didn't say that memory is the only aspect of system two, but it's, it's one important aspect. Like, whereas system one, you don't need memory. Like you have instantaneous computation that does a job and that's it, right? Yeah, in the back you have th the person in, in, that's further in the back and then I'll do the other one. It's not because of backpropagation through time. It doesn't matter how you compute it. It's the gradient. Yes, it's the nature of the gradient that is the sum of short-term and long-term effects. No, there is no alternative. It doesn't change how you compute it. It's the mathematical quantity that sort of hides information about the short-term uh, by the, the by the, uh, by the long term with the short term right so now if you if you wanted to separate these two then it's not gradient anymore you do something else for example in the in that paper we don't compute the true gradient and we get better results we 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 do retrieval to memory and we kind of skip all of you know i don't care what happened between the pub sound and when i decided that it was relevant i just make a direct connection between that old event and that recent event and and use it for learning right so the, the, the other person, yeah. Sets, yes, 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 right, right. So, so this is most obvious if you think about the transformer architecture, uh, which uh, I, I didn't go into details, but uh, uh, yeah, it's not very telling, but, but basically I think this picture tells more. So, so the way that, uh, uh, we use attention mechanisms without recurrence really means that we are processing a set of elements at a time. So each element in the set is going to have, say, a key and a value. And uh, we're going to create a new set that also has a key and a value. And that's going to be one layer of processing. And the way we're going to do that is, say, for example, like in these examples, uh, for the, the, the element at the next stage, we're going to compute a new value by taking a weighted uh, combination of the values at the uh, previous level in all of the elements of the set, weighted by the attention. And we're going to take that and pot potentially with multiple heads, so we're going to have multiple arguments, if you want, to an MLP, 
that takes these inputs coming from the previous layer, like it chooses some elements from the set, combines them as, concatenates them as arguments into an MLP, and the MLP produces a new value for the, uh, the new element. And you do that in parallel over all the elements of the new set, right? So you take a set and produce a set of the same size. And you do it over and over. Well, the, the, the underlying mechanism that allows us to do this is attention, right? So like the, the building block here is I'm able to compute for each element in the set how much I should pay attention to that element in computing a new value for the next element here. So attention is a mechanism, and the ability to operate on, set, on sets is what you get. Now, when you work on actual sentences and texts, or uh, I didn't mention, is what you do is you do care about the order, so a set isn't that great, but you can fix that easily by adding in the representation of each element something about its relative position compared to the other elements. Okay, yes, can you one more question. That would be a little bit too um, much self-serving, so I would say that um, uh, I think attention and, and uh, self-attention, I think, is, is solving, and, and memory are solving the, the, lo the, the long-term dependencies problem, yeah. All right, thank you.